but he still doesn't see his own hypocrisy. And so God sends a worm and a wind. The worm eats away at the vine, and the wind is hot and dries him out. And this vine withers, and Jonah is angry again. And God asks him the question a second time. He says, God said to Jonah in chapter 4, verse 9, Do you have a right to be angry about this vine? I do, he said. I'm angry enough to die. At this point, Jonah's sounding a bit whiny. <laughs> um, he's angry that God has taken away a grace that he didn't earn, that he didn't even perhaps deserve. Um, he's upset that God would not be gracious towards him once again. He says, save me from the fish, save me from the discomfort of this wind, uh, but don't save them. But the Lord said to Jonah, at the very end of the book, you've been concerned about this vine, though you did not tend it, you did not make it grow. It sprang up overnight and it died overnight. But Nineveh <clears throat> has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their left hand from their right hand and many cattle as well. Should I not be concerned about this great city? You know, if Jonah can be concerned about a vine, um, if he can take pleasure in God's grace in this small way, uh, can he, why is he angry about what God has done for others? <clears throat> the value of the city of Nineveh is certainly far greater than him <clears throat> or this vine. So again, we see that Jonah warns us about how often anger can just be so self-serving. We can get so caught up in what we're concerned about those people that we fail to see that we too are people in need <clears throat> of grace. When we notice the sin around us, we must have the heart of God rather than the heart of Jonah. <clears throat> we must have pity rather than anger. Let us hope for God's mercy for ourselves and for all people even those who disagree with us, even those who are different than us. We must let go of certainly all forms of racism or nationalism or favoritism. If we ourselves are candidates for God's mercy, then so is everyone else. When we embrace fear and anger, too often things get dirty. Um, We'll excuse poor character. We'll tell lies. We'll, we'll say, this is such an emergency. This is so important that I can dispense with graciousness because we need to do something about this. But there's no emergency. There's no danger that can ever be an excuse for us to turn away from living out the fruit of the Spirit or standing for grace, which is, by definition, undeserved favor of God. I think Jesus was actually serious when he said that we ought to love our enemies. And the example of Jonah, I think, can give us a couple insights to help us express this graciousness and mercy. Because mercy is easier to give when we see ourselves as recipients. Um, if I've received mercy, hopefully it can be easier to give mercy. When it says that Nineveh also is a, a city that they don't know their left hand from their right hand, uh, what, that's kind of a saying that th th they're in moral confusion. They, they, don't, they don't have God's teachings. These are Gentile peoples. They don't have God's law. They don't have the benefits that, that Jonah grew up with. They, they're a city in moral confusion. 
And I think we need to have that heart and recognition of others around us. Even though we live in a city where the gospel of Christ can be found relatively easily, so many people are unfamiliar with it. Uh, I run into people all the time who don't know a whole lot about what God has to teach. And that should in itself inspire us to have mercy on people because they don't maybe know all that we know. We can make an allowance for people who have a bit of moral confusion. God is concerned for them, and so should we. <clears throat> I love how the book of Jonah portrays God. For in all of Jonah's missteps, as he f outright flees from God, as he sits there grumbling about mercy, God never scolds him. He only ever really comes to him with questions. He comes in a very gentle way to Jonah and asks him, do you have a right to be angry? He's, he's, he's inviting Jonah to draw the conclusions. He's not bullying Jonah or running him down. And this is the example that we need to follow as we engage those who disagree with us, who have different values than us, those who are different than us. We need to have a heart for mercy and we need to have a compassionate concern. We need to follow Jonah's ultimate example of, of actually going and engaging Nineveh. I mean, that's a positive thing that he did. He, he engaged the culture. Um, some might argue he did it half-heartedly. If you look at his preaching in the book, it's like five words, he says. It says, 40 days and Nineveh is going to be overturned. Um, he doesn't really, it's almost as if he's giving them the minimum kind of message because he kind of doesn't really even then want them to hear it. But, I mean, he is engaging the culture and we too can't just dismiss people and leave them to their own misery. We need engagement, but we need a compassionate engagement. We cannot be ruled by anger because anger will only lead us wrong. It will only lead us to self-serving positions. So do you have a right to be angry? No, you don't. If you are one who's received mercy, then you ought to give. If God can have mercy on a disobedient prophet, he can have mercy on this great city. If God can have mercy on you and me, he can have mercy on those we disagree with. May we seek compassionate engagement, neither abandoning people to their misery nor fighting them with angry outbursts. Like Jonah, we should speak out but we must do it with a true sense of empathy and love. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we love your heart. We love how you have mercy on the undeserving, that while we were still sinners, you died for us. Help us to have a heart for others that we wouldn't just dismiss them and we certainly wouldn't fight them. May we engage our city with a compassionate heart. In your name we pray, amen. Thank you so much for the message. Uh, why don't we uh, stand up once again to uh, sing a response song.
Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God. May I be like you. Change my heart, oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God, may I be like you. standing, we'll invite Pastor Dave to do the benediction for us. Well, that's a good song to prayerfully end with, and it's something that we always need, isn't it? Well, let me challenge and bless you with these final words in 2 Corinthians, familiar. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. After a moment of silent prayer, we are dismissed. Mm -hmm.